from Wonderland. Hey, what's going on, everybody? This is Aaron Hilliard. Thank you for joining Mushroom Wonderland. If you're new to this channel, we talk mainly about wild mushrooms, and I head out into the woods, and we discover what mushrooms might be growing. Um, I live here in the Pacific Northwest, uh, about an hour from Seattle, and so I'm on the Kitsap Peninsula. Um, I'm also the uh, vice president of the Mycological Society here on the peninsula, and uh, I just have been foraging mushrooms my entire life. And so what I'm gonna do is just head out. It's October right now, and we're gonna be looking at what mushrooms might be growing out here. This is like the driest um, October on record with record highs today of 77 degrees, but it doesn't mean that there's no mushrooms growing out here. They're just a little bit trickier to find. Right here behind me on this stump, you can see one growing on this old dead log. Look at this old hemlock growing off of this log. That's how old this log is. And this mushroom right here, is uh, growing out of this old old log here. So let's pick it and have a look. Look at that, there's the entire base and everything. It's okay to pick mushrooms like this. This one is called the Tapanella atrotimentosa, or the uh, Velvet Footed Pax. Um, it used to be in a genus called Paxillus. So this is not considered edible, although you could eat it, it's not poisonous. But, uh, but people collect these for dyeing. Uh, so dyeing fabric like wool and silk. And so I've been collecting these and drying them out. So here's another one. I'm going to throw it in my bag and we're going to head on down the trail. So thanks for joining. Hit that subscribe button, smash that like button and leave a positive comment. And uh, let's head into the woods with me and my boy Gunner, my big hound lab right here. And let's see what's growing around here in the Puget Sound in the driest and hottest October ever. Thanks for joining. next to the trail and if you look at these uh, they're pretty unique looking they're very slender and cylindrical and uh, they have little scales on them but um, they could look a bit like a popular edible mushroom but these are not the shaggy mane so these mushrooms are known as a uh, copernopsis atramentaria and uh, also known as the alcohol inky cap so these mushrooms um, are fine to eat unless you consume alcohol uh, within a week after eating them uh, because they have a thing in them called coprine that will actually make you quite sick. Same uh, active ingredient as in an abuse that they use for uh, severely alcoholic people to help them to stop drinking. So if you like to drink, um, I would avoid eating these mushrooms and uh, simply uh, because they have such a weird reaction I personally would just kind of avoid them all together, but they do look like shaggy manes. They used to be in the genus uh, Caprinus with shaggy manes, but they were moved to Copernopsis. So um, related to the Copernopsis lagopus or the uh, hare's foot mushroom, this one grows in clusters like this and it's growing off of decaying wood that's underground, likely from the stump that's tipped over right here. And if you look right there, there's another mushroom growing here on the shelf. Uh, it's a shelf bracket type fun fungus here. So this one, let's pick this guy. And it's growing off of the dead wood too. Look underneath here, it's got all these pores. This is a pretty common one this time of year, another dying mushroom. And there's even more of them growing right over here. So this one is known as Phaeolus schweinitzii, or the dyer's polypore. This one's pretty thin, a unique looking one and very dark. But this one's used for dyeing fabrics, just like the uh, Tapanella atrotomentosa, and so uh, a useful mushroom. And uh, these Copernopsis atramentaria, useful mushroom if you want to quit drinking alcohol or have a deterrent from drinking, eat some of these, and uh, and hopefully that'll stop you from having a drink. So a couple of cool mushrooms here. I'm going to take the Dyer's polypore with me. I'm going to leave the Copernopsis and uh, 
actually I'm gonna take one just to study so just gonna toss them in this net bag here so today I'm carrying this neat little mesh bag it's got a little pouch sewn on the side of it I can keep the dog leash and uh, and I keep my little gathering knife little gather Americana knife you know I got these both on Amazon for pretty cheap I really like this bag well it's net so I guess it drops spores as you're walking but I like that it can just uh, fold it up it's not like a basket I can stuff it in my backpack I keep it under the seat of my truck actually just in case I see a patch of woods that I want to go foraging in go to the uh, description of this video and I put links in there for the knife and for the bag if you're a new mushroom hunter or an old mushroom hunter and you want a cool gathering device these are pretty nice and you could just buy a few of them they're like 15 bucks just toss them uh, under the seat of your car put one in your backpack for when you're hiking and uh, yeah really really handy compared to a basket so Oh, I've just been praying for the rain to come. I, I know all you mushroom foragers and mycophiles out there feel my pain here in the PNW. You know, we get uh, we get the reputation of having like the wettest area in the country, but we have seriously not had any real rain for a few months since like June. And here we are like heading into the end of the first third of October and it totally should be soaking here right now and gray and drizzly and raining every day and uh but despite the dryness and the record hot temperatures uh, mushrooms are still finding a way to grow so wherever they can find a little microclimate a little habitat that like has just enough moisture they're growing if you watch my last video where i was foraging i was finding lobster mushrooms um, and chanterelles like crazy uh, despite it being very dry so and then the Copernopsis and a ton of dying mushrooms out here. So there's still mushrooms to be had. And in a way, it's kind of exciting because you get to see what's popping up out here. Despite the dryness, some of these mushrooms, I mean, if there's a will, there's a way. And they're finding a way to grow. So. this there's quite a bit of moisture down in the soil you can hear frogs this is a good kind of area to look around where the water all drains down you know in a low spot there are mushrooms that you can find here when they're not growing elsewhere so yeah little damp areas like this can provide some fungal growth oh look right here growing right on the side of the trail these mushrooms do like to grow next to the trail, as do a lot of wild mushrooms. But this one is known as the uh, Rusula breva peas. So look, it's kind of a funnel shaped, big white mushroom. And it's uh, the short footed Rusula. They eat these in Russia, they pickle them. And uh, this one, oh look, it's got a white spore print, obviously. It's left white spores all over, all over the surrounding ground. And, and you can see the Rusula breva piece here. You can see that little short foot. It's the short stem. And then uh, it's got these gills. And uh, this is a well-known uh, lobster patch. And so this one is not lobsterized, which is very confusing. Um, the lobsters have all been kind of raided here. We could probably find a couple if we really looked close. But a lobster is actually one of these mushrooms that has been parasitized with another mushroom called Hypomyces lactiflorum. Look at right down here. I see a little shrimp. Let me show you right here. Uh huh. That bright orange color. Oh, it's slimy under there. Yucky. So, this is a lobster mushroom. It's pretty well past its prime. So, here's a good example of the Hypomyces lactiflorum after it has parasitized a Rusula brevipes. So, here's your 
here's your host mushroom and it's got this really short little stump white spores big white gills funnel shaped brown modeling on the cap and when it gets parasitized it turns into this contorted strange very bright orange little mushroom this one's past its prime but they're choice edibles when they're younger also good dyeing mushrooms for dyeing fabric with but here's a good example of the host and its parasitized counterpart when it's like this it's very desirable when it's like this very boring so there you go kind of a cool example there for you in case you were curious how the lobster mushroom worked but uh this little area i've been finding lobster mushrooms growing uh, despite the dryness too so they're definitely out there but a cool example just feet apart lobster mushroom hypomyces lactiflorum and the host the Russula brevipes, or the short-footed Russula. What we got right down here, grown amongst the sword fern here. So this is an ectomycorrhizal mushroom that likes to grow in association with the big conifer trees here in the Pacific Northwest. I'm gonna cut this one at the base, so you can have a look at underneath this is a prized choice edible. Cantharellus formosus, or the Pacific Golden Chanterelle. And these grow uh, mycorrhizally, meaning that they're associated with these big, tall, evergreen trees here. These are Western Hemlock. There's a Douglas fir over there. Both of these are good ectomycorrhizal host trees. And so this mushroom, really, really prized edible. You can find these in gourmet grocery stores. Notice the gills don't run. You know they don't stop in a perfect line they they're actually not regular gills they're just kind of ridges or veins so cantharellus formosus kind of smells like apricots and beautiful ruffly margin that's the edge of the cap there so these are dry but sturdy beautiful mushrooms and i'm going to put these in my bag so a nice find here in october golden chanterelles in washington And here's a young button. And with how dry it is out here, probably won't get a lot bigger than that. But we're going to leave that one alone. Probably run into some more. But a cool find. And quite a ways from any of these trees. So it's really stretching to, uh, to uh, touch the roots of those trees. And the trees grow in association with the fungus. And they really help each other out. Um, they benefit each other, and the tree doesn't grow well without the mushroom, and the mushroom can't grow at all without the tree. So quite an amazing little symbiosis happening there. Um, not only with chanterelles, but with all kinds of mushrooms. About 25% of the mushrooms out here are mycorrhizal. Actually, out here in a conifer forest in the northwest, most of the mushrooms we find are mycorrhizal. 25% of all mushrooms are mycorrhizal. So, uh, oh, look at right here. Wow, that looks a bit like a culture cub, but this one is another Dyer's polypore. Phaeolus schweinitzii, the Dyer's polypore. It's got that pore surface underneath there. Beautiful little guy. We're gonna leave it there so it can grow bigger, but a pretty little mushroom for sure. They're very common right now. They're everywhere. I've been seeing tons of Dyer's polypore. Um, so, yeah, actually pretty productive little day foraging out here, so not mad. I'm not mad about that, so that's kind of cool. And one thing to keep in mind is, like, walking on the main trails, yeah, there's going to be plenty of mushrooms off the beaten path, you know, there'll be chanterelles out there, but, uh, but you can find a lot of mushrooms just sticking to the trails. Uh, mushrooms seem to like to grow near disturbance. Uh, I think they have figured out that they can get their spores stuck on animals like Gunner and people like me. And I'm spreading just millions of all these spores. Now I have chanterelle spores, dyers, polypore, uh, you know, all the mushrooms that we've came across, lobster mushrooms, Russula breva peas. All these spores are on my hand. I got just millions of spores on me, no doubt. And I'm just sprinkling them along as I go, especially with my handy little sprinkle sack. So very cool. 
Check out this log right here, man. We got all kinds of cool stuff growing on it. Look at this into the ferns. There's more and more. Dyer's polypore. A uh, pretty common mushroom that grows here in the northwest. Always growing off of dead wood. This one puts off a pretty green color and then it can vary with mordants. But this log's growing quite a flush of these. Uh, it's got kind of a tongue twister for a name, but I think it sounds beautiful. The Feolus schweinitzii or the Dyer's polypore. There are other species of Feolus. Um, this one is really gold colored. And when it grows to maturity, it's going to become really maroon and just kind of look like a big chunk of bark or something weird but they even get better for dying as they mature from what i understand so very cool one growing here in the northwest right here in the beginning of fall and uh it's a Feolus schweinitzii down here growing on this this dead hardwood we've got these little guys oh man they're dried out seriously dried out there's little pores underneath there they're pretty dry they'd be like almost microscopic now because they're so dehydrated but these are known as tremetes versicolor or the turkey tail uh, highly medicinal mushroom the most studied mushroom in the world for medicinal benefits so pretty common mushroom and uh there's a couple of lookalikes that aren't dangerous but uh these ones have pores on the bottom and it's called tremetes versicolor because it's got so many different colors there's a, quite a variety of colors i've heard that the darker ones are actually more medicinal so um there's only a, a few here but you grind them up and make a tea i've heard it's actually more beneficial to leave the fruiting body in the tea so little chunks in your tea but uh but they're known to have antibacterial properties antiviral um, uh, an, you know antioxidant properties as well as anti-cancer properties so uh, i can't really personally speak to any of that but i have heard really good things about turkey tail treatment for all kinds of various ailments so medicinal mushrooms medicine right here in the wild um, if you're into that kind of thing. I am convinced that the more mushroom picking you do, the better you get at it. Your eyes get sharper. You're able to spot these mushrooms, pick out mushroom shapes out of all the craziness going on in nature. There's so much going on out here. And it's easy to overlook mushrooms, but I promise after you do it more and more, they'll become easier to see for you. By this time of year, I usually will have already found a bunch of porcini, the Boletus edulis. I know where a patch of those are that uh, grow right near here, uh, near my house, but um, they're just not up yet. So if you're discouraged, just hang in there until the rain comes and hopefully our mushroom season is gonna extend into you know, December and January. It just seems like everything has kind of shifted back a month. So hopefully uh, that's what's happening here is that we just got this really late summer and I feel like uh, once the rain comes, it's all gonna come at once and we're gonna have like just a spectacular mushroom fall. We had the craziest morel year ever. All summer long we've been finding chanterelle, so I have no reason to believe that this fall we're gonna find so many cool mushrooms out here. So don't be discouraged and just know there are still mushrooms out here, so don't be lazy. Get out there and find your mushroom. The construction never ends. All the forest around my house uh, is being just developed, just developed and developed and developed. I've, I've had patches that I used to pick in since I was a kid picking chanterelles and they've all been clear cut recently in the past couple of years. This is the thing around here lately. I don't know if it's like this all over the country. Y'all tell me. But there's little rocks everywhere that people are painting. Here's a leaf that somebody actually painted a little face on. So probably scare, scare the kiddos. But I don't know. Call it what you will. I don't know. Maybe you like it. Maybe you think it's littering. But uh, I see this a lot. I see a lot of uh, little painted rocks out in the woods. So 
cool. So look at this, despite how dry it's been, there's Sue Willis growing here on this lawn, as well as some Rusulas growing. These are ecto ectomycorrhizal mushrooms growing with these conifers. And these roots that are going underground are actually feeding some nutrients into these mushrooms. So look at this big patch of Rusula, these purple Rusulas, brittle gills they're called. They're very brittle. And uh, quite a big flush of them. So it's interesting, even though it isn't, uh, even though it hasn't been raining, um, the mushrooms are still coming up. Right here, we got a Lactarius deliciosus growing here next to the Rusula. So, pretty cool. Vase shape orange thing. These will often stain green, which is really nasty colored. Um, and then this area right here is a, a wetland restoration habitat where they've planted, they're trying to make it, you know, like nature, but it's not. And there's all these grass and wood chips in here. These are good places to look for psilocybe mushrooms in the, uh, in the fall. So once the rain really starts, but they got sprinklers, directional sprinklers here that are making all these mycorrhizal mushrooms like Lactarius. Rusula and Suwillis grow right on the side of the uh, road. So anyways, uh, pretty sloppy video, not very professional. I'm just out here trying to find whatever kind of mushrooms might be growing in this ultra dry October. So thanks for joining me on this episode and stay tuned. I'm trying to keep a video, at least one video a week. And there's going to be a video coming out shortly about foraging in the Rocky Mountains of Colorado in the summertime. But uh, until the next episode, let's keep praying for rain. Much love, everybody. Peace out.